Some of my favourite moments are those that aren't afraid to lend themselves to complete and utter absurdity. It's like this entirely different subsection of horror that resides within each subgenre that just revels in this chance to be so insane that it's almost infectious to watch things play out. I have so much fun with these types of movies that take all sense of logic and just throw them right out the window while still being able to supply this intensely entertaining viewing experience. Now this isn't to say that I don't have an abundance of praise for those films that could be equally as compelling while playing it straight, you know, that's a whole other feat within itself. If you haven't figured things out, today I wanted to talk about one of those absurdist movies, a psychological thriller released in 2009 and directed by Christopher Smith, also known for 2004's Creep. That's right, today we're talking about Triangle. That's a fucking rectangle. Uh, we're talking about Triangle. I often struggle to imagine that both of these movies are directed by the same person because they are two juxtaposing levels of both quality and engagement. I really didn't have fun with Christopher Smith's first movie here. I found that it felt really cheap in all of the bad ways with very little charm or anything to actually make it compelling. The revelation, if you could even call it that, was boring, uninteresting and lacked any bite whatsoever and overall it's a film that if you held a gun to my head and told me to pick any memorable moment from it, I'd probably ask you to tell my family that I loved them. Triangle is very much the opposite. Both of these are movies that I had no clue about when heading into 2023, however going out of it I can say that one of them I don't really remember much of, and one of them is a recommendation that I give to as many people as possible. Because in my honest opinion, this right here is an unpolished gem sitting in a cave of what was pretty garbage late 2000s horror. It's a film that builds itself on the art of a clever twist, that attempts to completely rework everything you think you know about what you're watching, and to make matters worse, just as you get your bearings with that, this thing does it again. It's that sort of seismic shift in the narrative that needs to be executed with an element of preciseness and purpose to avoid completely losing the audience. I'm not sure honestly what I find to be the bigger surprise here, the fact that the movie tries the same thing at least three times, or the fact that for me, it completely works. Upon first glance, Triangle might not make an ounce of sense to people who watch it, not ready for how convoluted it might become, because make no mistake, this thing isn't something you can afford to background watch. It kind of needs as much attention as you can give it to have that full desired effect, and even then, I, I mean, we'll get into it. Jess, our protagonist, played by Melissa George, is the first character we meet, and we immediately learn that she's a mother, and throughout an artistic opening credit sequence, we find out that the two of them are seemingly preparing to head out on a boat trip. This is all cute and fun, but it becomes a little more puzzling when we see Jess arrive at the boat a little later. She looks in a little bit of disarray here, and is also without her son, and when she's asked about his whereabouts, all she has to say is that he's in school. You told me she was bringing a little boy along. Yeah. So when I was walking from the harbor, I asked where he was. And she couldn't remember. She stared into space for like 20 seconds, and then she said he's at school. So? What's well, Saturday? There ain't no school today. Wait a minute. Is this our first mystery? Need school. It's open every day. Oh, never mind. To give you a quick run through of the characters here, we've got Jess, of course. We have Greg, the owner of the titular boat. His deckhand, Victor. His friend, Sally. Her husband, Downey. And their friend, Heather. Sound good? Good. Pretty early in the trip, Jess ends up passing out. And after having a strange dream or two, she wakes up, claiming to have had a headache. But from this point, she seems to brighten up considerably. She seems a lot more social and close with Greg in particular. And for a scene or two, that lingering feeling of unease seems to fade to the background a little. But it's only brought on once more by the arrival of a storm. After the wind stops completely, the passengers of the Triangle spot a huge storm that's rapidly approaching and aren't able to prep themselves and escape from it in time before it swallows the ship whole. This whole scene just oozes with this eye for fear. It's very claustrophobic and was able to get a pretty strong sense of discomfort from someone like me, who doesn't necessarily have that fear of tight spaces. This whole scene as the ship goes under is fantastic though. Everyone involved does a great job of selling the danger of the situation and the camera work adds another layer of uncomfortability and makes it all the more vivid for the audience. It's a neat little touch into an already effective scene and I can't knock the director and everyone involved for that extra little addition. Anyway, amongst all of this commotion we have Heather who was lost at sea and won't be seen again in this movie. 
You know, to all five of you Heather stands out there, I am so sorry for your loss. At this point, I want to make something known to people who haven't seen this film. I'm not going to be going through every explanation or plot point, at least initially. There's going to be things that I look back to later on in this segment and maybe even later in a latter segment. There are going to be things that I look back to later on in this segment or even in part two of the video, so just stay tuned if you're confused about anything. I promise it'll all hopefully make sense by the end. Initially this segment was just going to be a complete breakdown of everything in the movie, but I quickly realised that this made the video very front heavy, and also on top of that, watching me talk about the vid film like this only to then go back and go over details that you might have missed, very much emulates the same experience you have watching it for the first time, because it's that it's that sort of movie that just makes you need to rewatch it to understand certain things. Little random off tangent here, but um, Ailey, the person that normally reads these scripts, um, I I read through some of the notes that she had when she was uh, reading through this one, and I, I'm pretty sure I wrote stuff that she didn't pick up on, so that's, you know, it, it takes multiple viewings and then reading interpretations of it to fully understand things. I don't know what to tell you. The group are stranded for an amount of time that's never outright stated, but I guess it was around a few hours. And before too long, they're saved by the arrival of a mysterious ocean liner called the Aeolus that just sort of appears out of nowhere, and I'm surprised it takes people as long as it does to spot it, but what are you gonna do? They all board the liner and soon find that this thing is completely deserted, even though they'd seen someone on deck as it approached, adding this keen sense of both intrigue and mystery about the state of the ship. Even at this point, I found myself trying to figure out what sort of horror experience I was in for. Was it going to be a slasher? Some sort of supernatural stick? Perhaps even just a plain old psychological scare? It's both all and none of these. Another weird circumstance of their situation is that despite there being no one on board, the survivors stumble across a freshly prepared selection of food in the dining room. We are also shown several times throughout this whole initial exploration that Jess is feeling this odd sense of deja vu and things take their weirdest turn yet when they discover Jess's keys on the ship. The movie is filled with so many of these little moments that makes the eventual payoff even more rewarding. There's this sudden turn of events where they spot someone watching, prompting Victor to run off in the direction of that person. While this happens, we see Jess and Greg deviate from the other two and come across a mirror with a message written in blood. Greg tries to play it off as this elaborate prank, which is just... such a dumb fucking conclusion. Like, how do you see this weird shit and come to that of all possibilities? This is a common theme with a lot of characters in this movie. You know, I don't want to insinuate that they're just plain old dumb, but they're not exactly the smartest of fucking people. And you know, I'm not gonna say it's a bad thing, because sometimes you need dumb people in horror movies for horror movies to make sense. It's sort of what this genre has to do sometimes. But there are ways to be believably dumb, and I'm not sure that fucking Greg over here truly gets that. After getting over the stupidity of Greg, Jess finds her way back to the dining room, only to find that all of the food is now rapidly rotting, and definitely not something I'd like to be eating. At this point, Victor reappears, but this time he's covered in blood, seemingly from a wound on his neck. He tries to kill Jess here, telling her that she did this to him, which... no. Despite his best efforts, unfortunately, Liam Hemsworth was not the victor of these Hunger Games, because Victor fucking dies. I'd like to clarify that I suggested this joke to someone in the script, and they told me it was kinda out of place and I probably shouldn't have it. I'm really hoping I don't regret keeping it in. We hear a cannon, I mean gunfire, coming from the direction of the theatre room, which coincidentally was where the message on the mirror was telling them to go. And this is where things get really fucking weird if you're not over me saying that, because Greg is dead. Yeah, that guy that we all thought was going to survive, at least to probably near enough the end of this movie, he, he's fucking gone. His heart is flatlined and very likely exposed based on that shotgun shell that's ripped through his chest. What makes it odd though is that Sally and Downey are claiming that Greg's last words were to tell them that the shooter was Jess. Yeah, I won't lie, from here it's not the most difficult thing to figure out what's happening, but we'll still go through it in real time. A masked shooter from the balcony above shoots both Sally and Downey, killing them instantly and leaving Jess as our sole survivor with a pretty large amount of runtime to go. Not gonna lie, things are going a little too quick for this to be as cut and dry as it's making out to be. She's chased onto the deck and ends up having a fight with the assailant, eventually disarming them and being told that the only way to get home is to kill them. Now you might be wondering, but Jordan... Her friends are dead. Who does she have to kill? 
Well, ladies and gentlemen, turn your direction to the sound of that yelling that Jess hears, because this is a fucking time loop movie. Now, this was something that I had began to put together through watching the film myself, but the eventual revelation that I was right and this was some sort of cosmic horror film just made the whole viewing experience that much better. The moment where it's revealed that Jess was the shadowy figure on the boat that the survivor saw instantly made me run back through so many minor moments and ask myself whether there was actually a level of significance to what I'd seen. Suddenly, Jess's keys being there made sense. Victor, Sally and Downhill accusing Jess of murder, sure still seems a little out of character, but given what the assailant told Jess, it makes sense why she might be driven to that. The second set of survivors board here and look, I know the original crew is pretty much dead, but when referring to these guys, I'm now going to throw a two in front of their names, because to avoid confusion mainly, because this is going to... I'm gonna need it for later on, let's just put it that way. Jess 1 begins to follow the survivors around and gets spotted when she drops her keys near a display case. She gets chased down by Victor 2 who eventually corners her and after she tries to warn him about what's happening, she accidentally impales his head on a wall hook. This is an admittedly weird moment that might not be out of place for some, but there was just something in this scene of all things that really took me out of it a little bit and I can't really explain why. She stumbles across this little cave that the shooter had been hiding in and finds dozens of identical outfits, several shotguns too, and her own locket as well as a note that tells her once again to kill all of them once they've boarded. The weirdest part of this is that it's in her own handwriting. She takes one of the shotguns with the intention of changing the pattern, but the shooter, who if everything until this point wasn't a big enough reveal, this ought to do it, shows themselves to be a third Jess and repeats the loop for her by killing Greg too and Downey too before they shoot Sally too, who survives for a little bit longer. There's this real interesting game of cat and mouse that the two Jesses are playing here, involving some neat moments with the evil murdery Jess acting as the innocent protagonist Jess, and it adds this cool little action segment to a movie that's been channeling more of a generic thriller until this point. I also understand that it might be a tad confusing to try and actually follow along with what I'm saying and don't worry that it, the exact same feeling is felt when you're watching through the movie. While original Jess chases Sally too, we get this moment where Sally sends a distress signal to anyone capable of picking it up. Now what's cool about this is that it's one of those details I said I was omitting from before because we hear this distress signal on the triangle moments before the storm arrives. Sally eventually dies amongst what looks like a mass grave dedicated to herself and it's here that we get a real feel for the scope of this loop. I do admit though that it's this scene that makes me kinda unsure about how this loop actually operates. We see with other examples that the bodies disappear when a loop begins but it almost seems as if that doesn't apply on this specific deck. I'm sure there's probably some explanation for it and it's not just an oversight from people involved. After this we see original Jess watch Jess 2 kill the shooter Jess, Jesus Christ that was a mouthful, by throwing her overboard similar to what original Jess had done earlier. Once again the triangle appears and our next set of contestants arrive. Jess comes to the conclusion that the loop only restarts when everyone has been killed, now realising what the shooter had told her on the deck before. Filmed with this newfound determination to stop the loop, Jess realises that killing her friends is really the only way out of this and so begins to set everything from loop 1 into motion. It's such a rewarding experience to revisit Triangle knowing what you know because it's really neat seeing the film set up every strange and unusual circumstance from the previous or the earlier scenes. Doing it later on obviously from the perspective of, you know, someone that was living through that in confusion at the time. We also get the scene of her wrapping a bag around her face as a mask, but I think it's really interesting to look back on certain scenes, especially like the theatre scene for example, knowing what we know now and knowing that it's not just this senseless lust for violence. We see the initial attack play out the same way, and this time it's from the perspective of the original Jess, now on the opposite side, and this ends the way we'd expect it to, with this Jess being forced overboard after telling her duplicate that the only way she can return home is by killing her friends. After an undetermined amount of time, we see Jess wake up on the shoreline, instantly connecting this to her dream that she had while on the triangle. She returns home only to realise that this is still part of the loop? She didn't even escape? She just got right back to the start, and we learn that it's the original Jess who rang the doorbell at the start of the film that had distracted the uh, original Jess... Uh, wait a minute. I've just realised I've got literally no clue on how I'm supposed to refer to this new Jess. I mean, she's technically the original Jess because she's the first one we see in the movie, so I guess we could call her original Jess? Maybe Jess 4? Jess who gets her head caved in by protagonist Jess? Yeah, this is a bit of a sensitive subject, but as it turns out, we see that Jess wasn't a particularly great parent to Tommy. 
It is also said online that Tommy has autism, so Jess abusively shouting at him really isn't a nice thing to watch. After everything original Jess has gone through to get back to him, we see her realise how fucked up she was before, and so desperate to make things change, she brutalises her other self, killing and replacing her and hiding the body in the trunk of her car, promising to change and be a better mother, because who wouldn't do that? So that's it, surely we've reached the end of the loop, there's no other knife to twist, right? While trying to escape with Tommy, there's this moment where a seagull hits the windshield and dies, but when Jess tries to pick it up and dispose of it, she comes across a pile of dead seagulls because this is still part of the fucking loop. The realisation of this sends Jess into a panic and she quickly tries to drive away with Tommy. She's clearly not in any right headspace though because after a lapse in concentration, she collides with a truck with Tommy dying on impact with her corpse in the trunk being found dead at the scene. In the aftermath of all of this, the original Jess watches the accident scene in silence, overhearing a bystander claiming that nothing can bring him back. A taxi driver approaches and Jess accepts a ride to the horror. In a bit of eerie foreshadowing when she arrives, Jess promises the driver that she'll return soon before joining Greg and the others on the triangle, starting the loop once more and hoping that this time she can do things differently and bring back her son. Okay, that's it. No, really, no more twists and turns. That is Triangle. So with that, let's finally try and dissect and put meaning to the insanity that we have just gone through. Triangle is genuinely insane. It's surprising that it took me as long to find it because I mean it when I say that despite some slight moments that pull me out of things a little, I find myself having a largely positive experience with this movie. The way it chooses to mess with both time and also the concept of triangles is something really specific and well thought out to me. For example, we have the fact that there are always three versions of Jess running around at any given time. You have the Jess that arrives, outliving the other two until she's thrown out of her board by the new arrival. This of course is a connection with a triangle with its three points, where the starting point becomes the end point and starts again. I did a little bit of thinking while writing this script about the morality of Jess as a character. The finale of this film makes it clear that she wasn't a great parent and upon first glance the decision to off your friends could be seen as a bit of an irredeemable act to some. But given the context of Jess's situation, I think it's interesting to question whether or not she truly believed she was doing the right or the moral thing. Throughout the movie, we see Jess witness the return of her friends at least twice, and with that in mind, part of me wonders whether she didn't necessarily view her actions as the cold-hearted murder that it is, knowing that they would just come back. There is a ton of referential content connecting this film with Greek mythology and rooting the horror in amongst that. This was something I got a lot more insight into after watching the film with a friend, but I think looking back at it with all of this makes it infinitely more interesting to look back on, noticing all the little subtleties in the narrative that feed this concept. When boarding the cruise ship for the first time, our group learns that the name of this ship is the Aeolus. This was also the name of the Greek ruler of the winds. However, this is also the father of Sisyphus, which was a name that was brought up in the film. As explained in said scene with an admittedly obnoxious level of foreshadowing, the story goes that Sisyphus broke a promise with death and as a result is punished with an unending task where he'd need to push a boulder to the top of a hill. The caveat here is that every day the boulder's progress would reset, dooming him to be repeatedly doing this over and over again without any end in sight. This feeds as a direct correlation to Jess, and especially in the film's closing moments. She promises the driver she's going to return, only to then get on the boat anyway, thus breaking the promise with death, and subsequently being trapped in an unending series of loops of which there is no escape. The taxi driver at the end of the movie also has some sort of mythological part to play, with people attributing him to the role of the ferryman, an entity that serves to deliver lost souls to purgatory. This is what Jess is directly experiencing through the film and it's exactly why the film ends at the beginning point. She cannot escape this triangle. There is another description of the name Aeolus that is worth mentioning here because of the relevance it shares to the film. In Greek mythology, it was a name that was shared amongst three people of mythical stature. These three personages were difficult to tell apart and it's left ancient mythographers baffled and confused when trying to determine which Aeolus was which. This continues to secure and refer back to the fact that everything in this movie comes in threes. We have the three loops, we have Jess waking up three times during the film. There is so much hidden symbolism in this movie and I just think it's so much smarter than people are giving it credit for. It's competently made and it features a ton of little things that people can notice and feel a level of accomplishment for spotting. 
It also has a ton of your standard Shining references that you typically see in horror movies too. But whereas other movies tend to do it egregiously, I noticed more so that with Triangle they were very much in the background, they weren't in your face. I think the movie throws them in subtly and tastefully. I don't think they're ever an obnoxious reference. It's often a very fluid moment in a scene and sometimes even comes in the form of a narrative parallel. You've also got the repeated visuals and audio references to themes within the movie. Here, I'm referring to things like the marching band in the film's ending, with the symbol present on the drum being an interlocked A and O, an anglicised version of Alpha and Omega, which in Greek symbolises the beginning and the end. You've also got the car crash in the exact same scene. The car wreck is visible in a few shots after the crash itself, as is the remains of a licence plate, but what's interesting is that the only number visible is an A. You know, like the infinity symbol and infinite loop. Are you seeing what I'm getting at yet? Triangle is neat and in my opinion you really need to give it a shot. It's not perfect, don't get me wrong, I feel like I've done a pretty good job in this video of highlighting there are even elements of it that I'm not fully on board with. But for the most part this is a really intriguing look at one of the better examples of the late 2000s supplying a genuinely satisfying horror thriller experience. Even if the movie does feel more rooted alongside a thriller action-y type approach. There is this really sleazy digital look to the movie and it's present in a lot of films from this time. It's not really something you can avoid all that easily, but in Triangle, while it's still noticeably got that look and feel, it doesn't feel nearly as ugly to look at because of some of the great camera work on display here. There's a shot sometime during one of the loops that travels through a mirror and I fucking love this. It's always really cool to me when a film uses technical aspects like sound or camera work to convey themes and help solidify what we're being told. Despite how great I personally think Triangle is, it's love that has unfortunately only come around in the last five or so years. It was created on a budget of around 12 million US dollars and somehow only made a return of 1.6 million worldwide, which is a dismal one and it's a little bit of a shock due to the praise given to it by both critics and the audiences, with both of them praising Smith's direction and the performances, with extra praise being heaped on Melissa George. On top of this, the themes, suspense and timely aspects of the film got heavy appreciation from audiences and with all of this in mind, it makes the turnout with its box office results majorly disappointing, although it's not that hard to ignore that a large part of it was probably due to the British-Australian co-produced film never receiving a release in the US. While never fully receiving the credit it deserved at the time, I'm truly glad that Triangle is finally receiving its time in the spotlight because it is a criminally underrated reminder that horror can be cool and unique if given the right directorial vision. I haven't really delved deeper into Smith's work and after the 50-50 experience I've had so far, I'm not sure when I make it around to the other stuff. But there is a definite feeling of class and intelligence of filmmaking here. Sure, not everything works all the time, but when it does, Man, does this movie feel special. Triangle may not be for everyone, but when you can get past that unappealing digital look and the occasional lapse in rational thinking from certain characters, it proves itself as a more than competent cosmic horror thriller that stands out as being incredibly creative and unique when compared to some other films releasing at the time. Uh, hello? So it's became clear to me, maybe around 30 seconds after I finished editing the video you just watched, that I didn't actually do the outro. That was part of the script that I just completely forgot to record. So rather than go back downstairs and do it, I thought I'd let you see the new little setup I've got here for editing and also just do the outro here. Why not? So that is Triangle. It's a fun little movie that I personally have a lot of fun with and I think you should give a shot if you haven't already. Once again, I apologise for the lack of uploads. I am working on trying to get the schedule a little bit better, but motivation lacked a little in the last couple of months and I'm really hoping that I can kick on from here. I really feel like the new editing style that I've done, bringing back the green screen and stuff like that, it brought a new level of enjoyment to that video, even though it was a bitch to edit. But if you did enjoy it, please leave a like that does let me know that I'm doing something right with the content. Also subscribe if you're new and you don't want to miss out on next month's video and the month after and the month after. And yeah, I guess until next time, I've been Media13. I'll see you in the next one. Um, I've got nothing. Goodbye.